and welcome back. Wow, it is awesome to be back to another Market Open live stream. Let's find out what exactly we've got going ahead of us and what's also been behind us the last few days. Remember the last few days here, folks, have been kind of a little seesaw-y, a little bit nuts. Mostly it all started after that CPI report. CPI report didn't even come in that crazy low, but it was just a signal that, you know what, that hyperinflation is behind us. So much, so much fear uh, in the economy that hyperinflation is still coming again. I was listening to a video just the other day where somebody was, was you know, getting, uh, what, like 150, 200,000 views on this, this idea that mortgage rates are going to go to uh, uh, 20, 19 to 20% again, because that's the long-term super cycle. And, and, and to me, it, it is so disconnected from the reality that we face, which is, wait a minute, we're actually in, in a world where inflation dynamics are so vastly different from what we had back in the 70s. We've known, especially in our course member live streams, that back since even the beginning of these uh, of, of, of the uh, this cycle, uh, at least uh, over the last... Um, nine uh, what month are we in now november 11 months here uh we've seen the turn in the earnings call it's uh, uh, earnings calls and earnings from companies that the inflation is trending away at least the growth of prices rapidly the ability for companies to actually continue raising prices is substantially waning and you can see the pain in in the uh the executives who are like well you know our goal is to provide more value when they get asked about pricing and and uh the reality is they, they, they can't raise prices anymore uh certainly not as high as uh, as they have been so um uh, you know in, in the long term and we know this we've talked about this so much inflation will prove to be long term transitory it'll just have taken a lot more time and, and i do think that's frustrating because a lot of people hear transitory and still get triggered by the thought that the Fed was basically a total moron uh, in in suggesting that transitory would be short term, right? Uh, and that is painful when uh, a Fed says, "Oh, don't worry about the inflation. We can ignore this because it'll go away." And and the reality is, we get shock after shock after shock that turns us into what what a two year disaster. I mean, think about it. Two years ago, now is when we have the peak of the last market, uh, essentially, the, the, the last cycle. And uh, for a lot of people, the last two years have been very painful because we're, we're not in a, a growth or bull cycle. You know, buying the dip has been, has been punishing over the last two years. Uh, certainly, if you've been exposed to margin uh, or or some of the smaller cap, more volatile stocks, so it's it's horribly painful and totally uh, is is understandable uh, why uh, there's so much frustration in uh, in markets and not just markets today, but also politics. Right? Pol our, our politicians are the ones we point the finger at uh, when there is this sort of frustration. But uh, in the long term. That is what we're seeing now, especially started with a CPI, uh, with the CPI data release. In the long term, we're trending towards being able to say that, yeah, you know, it was transitory. It just wasn't transitory over six months. It was transitory over three years. Uh, and then, of course, you were stuck with the higher prices after that. Nobody's saying that's transitory. That's a bummer, though, for people because prices are going to stay higher. Uh, this right here is your five-year forward break even. You can see how we behaved over the last few days here. We had a nice little plummet, CPI, PPI. But mostly that Empire Manufacturing report really uh, led people to think that, oh, what, are, are we going back into boom mode here? That Empire Manufacturing report, that's the New York uh, Manufacturing report, is so volatile. Uh, and uh, that number yesterday was was uh, was pretty extreme. Let me pull up the uh, the exact number. I think they had a read of nine for Empire Manufacturing. Everything above uh, zero is considered growth. Yeah, they came in at nine point one. It was expected to come in at negative three. So it you know it's a little weird because. Business inventory is coming in where you expect them to. You have uh, Empire Manufacturing coming in way hot and then inflation lower. It suggests almost like a booming economy. Rates have to stay higher, right? Uh, okay, now we just got import prices. Okay, import and export prices. Import prices month over month, data release 0. 0.6 versus the negative 0.3 we expected. Now that's uh that's um uh, that does include higher prices due to energy because as soon as we take import prices minus just petroleum 
we get negative 0.2, but we were looking for negative 0.3 there. So here's a, a an inflation data release that came in a little bit warmer here. Import prices year over year, negative 2% versus the negative 1.8 we were looking for. Export prices down more at uh, negative 1.1%. Initial jobless claims just came in a little higher at 231,000 with continuing claims at 1.865. Little change from last week. Philadelphia Fed outlook was expected to come in at negative eight, actually just came in at negative 5.9. Again, this is this is a way of, of showing, hey, prices are, are stable to trending down. Uh, you know, again, we're not back to 2019 levels, but stable to trending down. And what you have is uh, this the uh, these data releases that are suggesting, hey, are, are things really that bad. I think that's why uh, the Atlanta Fed, which was clowned so much, uh, is actually probably a, not a horrible tool to look at. I mean, they got it so right in the uh, in the last uh, GDP report, uh, the uh, quarterly GDP report. They were so right that GDP was trending around uh, the upper four percent range, and what well, we had we had a re release of four point nine percent. People thought that was that was going to be so off uh, or that the data is rigged, which, the, you know, that belief is, is still present. Uh, but uh, right now, the Atlanta Fed has uh, revised these numbers uh, for the current quarter, at least. Uh, looks like right now we're sitting at about 2.2%. That's the latest read from the Atlanta Fed. Keep in mind, this Atlanta Fed data, I, what I think is really interesting about it is they take the data like PPI, CPI, uh, the uh, empire manufacturing, import prices, retail sales, they take all of that data and they merge it into one forecast or sort of like an averaged forecast uh, or snapshot in time, so to speak. You look at like uh, retail sales yesterday, those came in. Oh, well, hello. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on one sec. We'll come back to retail sales here. Uh, import price. Did they just revise this? Import prices month over month. Yeah, they totally did. It's actually negative 0.8. They typoed it. Negative 0.8 versus the 0.3, negative 0.3 we were expecting. However, the prior release was revised up. Uh, interesting. I think they, they put it in the wrong spot or something. Anyway, all right. Uh, prior release revised up to 0.4 versus the 0.1. But once you exclude petrol, you're at negative 0.2 versus the negative 0.3 expected a negative 0.3 we were looking for prior so uh very good this is uh this is gonna be a quite an interesting end to this cycle mostly because you know there's there's everyone's looking at rates and whatever yields do the market is paying strong attention to uh, although it's not directly correlated on a day-to-day -day basis you know yesterday the market was nearly flat the 10-year treasury jumped over about 10 basis points Today, the 10-year treasury is going right back down 6.6% or yeah, 6.6 .6 points to the downside basis points. And uh, now you've actually got the market slightly red, about a quarter, quarter on the NASDAQ, third on the NASDAQ, S&P 513, Dow 15. Uh, BTC pushing back up to this um, 37 level here. There was a period of time here where it was selling off uh, just over the last few days during uh, some of these uh, these CPI uh, releases and data releases. You can see that here we dropped under 35 there for a moment. Uh, yeah, and then this, this strong rapid rally again uh, late yesterday, uh, only now to uh, start selling off again. So it's, it's coming in these waves. I find it very interesting. So, uh, okay, good. Uh, you've got uh, Kenny G also, who uh, well, I thought this was neat. You know, he's he's talking about this idea that that companies have less of a bond with their employees now post COVID and they're more willing to let them go. I'm not sure where he's getting this idea from, you know, personally, it, it, it just seems like to be the opposite that more connected with employees and, and uh, that what we're really trying to do is, is get to uh, a place where small businesses, medium businesses, large ones, mostly okay. Feel like they can spend through, however long the cycle is going to be. And if we start getting these, these rate cuts uh, that a lot of folks are now projecting for March, then maybe uh, it is possible uh, that we end up getting uh, 
people holding on to their employees. Let's look at the uh, world interest rate probability curve. I always think this is an interesting one to look at. Uh, so the WERP basically just shows rate cuts ahead. This, uh, what you'll see what I mean when I show you this chart. This chart used to be kind of like a, a hump, like a bell curve, uh, because rate hikes were still ahead of us. And what you'll find now is that it's basically just a straight down, uh, which I think is quite interesting. All right, stand by and action. There you go. This is what we have for rate cuts ahead. Mm. This position's our first rate cut for March. Uh, that would be about, March is pricing at about negative 0.3. Uh, that's slightly greater than one rate cut. Markets then pricing in three cuts by May. Wait, hold on. I'm reading this wrong. Hold on. The implied. Oh, this is a funny little thing. Rate cuts, negative 0.325, negative 0.837. Yeah, but the rate isn't actually going down that fast. Oh, 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 okay. This is just the number of cuts, not the percentage of cuts. My bad, my bad. Okay, they're pricing in a third of one rate cut here. I get it, okay. You're pricing in nearly a full rate cut at 0.87. My bad, <laughs> uh, right here. And uh, then in the next one, you're pricing in one about 1 1.4. So this is about 1.4 rate cuts right here. The next one is pricing in 2.6. So by July, we've got two rate cuts fully priced in. You've got three priced in by November. Is that right? Yeah. And then December, you almost have four cuts, uh, four rate cuts priced in, which is about the equivalent of 1%. Now, it's important to remember. Uh, hell yeah, Steve. It's important to remember, give me a sec, uh, that... These rate cuts, something to remember, what will add fuel to the fire of rate cuts, I guarantee it, what will add fuel to the fire of rate cuts will be joblessness. So uh, even though, and we know this, we know this, this is old news, but joblessness is very lagging. And that's okay, though. It's okay for it to be very lagging. That, that What that just means is it's going to take longer for the Fed to wake up and actually you know, cut rates substantially. I believe that as soon as you get a Fed that realizes they've turned over the labor market and you start getting to below trend labor, I believe that's when you end up getting a Fed that actually starts saying, okay, let's cut faster. Because what, what they're playing right now is this funny teetering game. Uh, they're playing this game and you can't blame it right now. But what, what you're really trying to do is, look, if, if you're the Fed, I think this is pretty simple, okay? Your thinking is, okay, jobs, good, right? And so how are we growing at jobs? Well, uh, long average, 180-ish K. Current average, 250K. Current, 180K, all right? So that actually means we could have some below-trend growth in jobs, right? CPI? Too high. We know that. Trending down. So keep working here until, until what? Well, in my opinion, once this drops below 100K per month, that's, that's when you start saying, okay, 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 okay. Can we rely on the CPI reduction to be self-sustaining? Let's now go rescue draw jobs. So that jobs report, a lot of people think I'm nuts for saying it, but because especially because, look, we had the jobs report, market didn't really move much. With the CPI report, market skyrocketed. So, of course, everybody wants to pay attention to the CPI report. I agree. I, I mean, I was obviously watching it very anxiously as well. But uh, but over the next year, we will transition to finding that, OK, yeah, inflation is going to keep coming down like this, probably. You know, okay, we're warned that it's supposed to be lumpy or whatever. Sure, fine, who cares? Uh, but uh, as far as uh, the Fed's ability and capacity to actually keep rates higher for longer, it's all going to come down to unemployment. And uh, remember the last employment report came in at 150,000. 
the estimate was 180. That's our trend. So we already had a below trend read at 150. That's why people are like, all right, Fed's done. You start getting that number under 100K I, and inflation is trending the way it is. I think it's at that point you have a Fed that says, we are confident inflation is going to trend down. And now we need to make sure that we uh, reduce our uh, uh, risk of, of creating a longer term recession. Uh, and and that, that will be driven by jobs, jobs o- almost entirely. Jobs keep everything going. And I know a lot of people worry like, but Kevin, things are so, so much more expensive now. Remember, we have real wage growth now. We are back to real wage growth. We covered this during the jobs reporting as well. And, and I know that it's, it's painful to think about it because, you know, we think to ourselves like, what the hell? Like, I don't feel like I'm making more money than, than I was, you know, uh, before, before all this inflation. If anything, most people feel like either we're making less, especially small business owners, either you feel like you're making less and well, it's actually an and. So you feel like you're making less and you're, uh, you know, you're spending more. So what the hell, like how, how could it feel like there's real wage growth? And you know, that's just, that's just the aggregate. That's just the, the, uh, you know, the data set to the extent that it, 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 it can be believed, but what we're looking for are the changes in the reports, because we know the reports aren't perfect. I like to look at the reports and go, okay, well, what are the changes in the reports? And uh, that has turned positive. Real wage growth has turned positive in June, July. That is a way that you could sustain an economy. I know it sounds nuts to say that it's okay to sustain it. Like, and I'm not saying it's okay, but I know it sounds nuts to say that, you know, just having a little bit of real wage growth is enough to keep the economy out of recession as long as people keep their jobs. So if you have both, people keep their jobs and real wage growth, now all of a sudden you have enough for people to keep living paycheck to paycheck and being miserable, but actually keeping the economy out of recession. That's just like from the economic point of view. Now from a humanitarian point of view, this was stupid. Uh, you know, all the, all the spending. Uh, anyway, here's your real wage growth, just slightly above the rate of inflation, uh, which does provide at least usually nominal growth to staples, right? This isn't like real growth. This is faux PP. We talk about that all the time. Faux PP. What is faux PP? Think about that. Faux PP is when companies are like, oh yeah, you know, our our, uh, earnings are up 9% year over year. Yeah, congratulations, bro. Inflation was 9%. So you literally did nothing, right? Uh, So so those are the companies bragging of free uh, faux PP. Uh, Let's see here. Can you explain why specifically smaller owners, I'm in this boat, well, I believe that um, basically I'm calling you poor. Sorry, <laughs> like not necessarily you, but that's I'm just to be blunt. Smaller business owners have less capital than Microsoft. Okay, that's obvious. Like compared to Microsoft, we're all poor. We're all bankrupt compared to Microsoft. Okay, so a company like Microsoft has so much cash on the side that they're actually earning about twice what they're spending in interest. So they're spending $450 million in interest. They're earning $900 million in interest payments, payments on their cash. A small business, small businesses are paying average rates of seven to 8%. I'm not talking about new debt. I'm talking about average debt that a small business person is paying is seven, 8%. Whereas you go look at uh, a Microsoft, their bond coupon averages for, for these blue chips are 2.99%. So they've locked in cheap debt. Small business owners are stuck uh, with with expensive debt. And you have less of a capital reserve than than a company like Microsoft. So so that's why smaller businesses are more in a position of uh, of struggling and pain. Let's listen in here for a moment. Let's see what Becky Quick and them have to say for a moment. Uh, wait a sec. This is, they're just talking about Berkshire and some random deal. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll actually come back to that. We'll finish this thought. Uh, so, uh, but I do think that's, uh, that's, a, a, an important consideration to remember. So faux PP is your rapper name. Hell yeah. Let's go. So me, Kevin app going to post notifications for all these. We, you know, we can do that if, if folks would like that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, this is going to be an interesting transition, you know, because, you know, going live on this channel is not going to get near the attention uh, that uh, that the other channel got, at least to start with. So we'll have a smaller audience here for a while. The same will be true on the podcast channel. The same will be true 
on you know politics or whatever, which we'll do at 9 a.m. There's there's a, a lot of work to do to help uh, everybody make sure they get where they want, but then also proving a consistent schedule because I'll tell you the last thing that I've been has been consistent over the last two years. And that's mostly because there's been there's been so much change uh, that's that's gone on. So, you know, not changing is also very dangerous, but it, it would be very good to have consistency again. And I think now that we've kind of gone through experimentation mode, it's consistency time and build from there. So, yeah, uh, that's that's no problem. Uh, yeah. Mm. Didn't know you had a second live channel. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. You already commented on the Walmart statement. Nope. I'll go get it. Let's see what we got. Let's do it together. <laughs> all right. All right. All right. All right. Walmart. So, holiday promotion levels to be as expected. Walmart sees sales growth moderate, moderating in Q4 as inflation ebbs. Walmart, did they just report? This sounds like a an earnings call. Oh, look, they're losing their faux pee pee. <laughs> Although Target, I will say Target did very well. Let me see what, what the difference was between the two. I see both of them as staples. Technically, Target is seen as a discretionary and Walmart is seen as a staple. I think that's stupid. I see them both as staples, but whatever. I actually really like Target, but every time I say that, people get mad at me. They're like, but Kevin, they've gone woke. Oh, my God. They're like, their store is so much like cleaner than uh, than the Walmarts. I know, that's at least been my experience. Okay, uh, Walmart EPS 153 versus the 152. So you got a one penny beat here. We have Sam's Club. Comp sales excluding gas up 3.8%, slightly above estimate. That's not that's barely inflation, man. Come on, dude. A Walmart total comp sales 4.7% versus the 3.35. Also, again, barely inflation. What inflation average over the last year, quite frankly, is probably what 5%, 4.5% over the last year. Uh Walmart tops earnings as e-commerce e helps drive 5% in sales. Again, that's that's not anything more than inflation. Uh, okay. So here's their commentary. Could have done a better job on Q3 expenses. CEOs on the earnings call says legal expenses hit profit. No way. Here we go. Here it is. You ready for this? You ready for this? Walmart CEO sees possible deflation in the coming months. No freaking way. I mean, this is, it's not a surprise. Uh, you know, another faux PP reporting company covering live, uh, now, uh, on MK live Walmart, uh, tanks over 6% now as the CEO warns of deflation. We got to send that tweet. It's actually crazy. Uh, okay. Let's look at the rest of what he's saying though, because it's, there's more here. But wait, there's more. Could have done a better job. Uh, okay, warns of deflation. Okay, so what do we have here? Possible deflation in coming months. Yep, that's not a surprise. Then we have legal expenses, hit profit, grocery inflation is moderated. Okay. Late October slowdown was off trend. That's interesting too. Uh, holiday promotion levels to be as expected. I don't know if that's much of a surprise. Mm. Okay, here is he's talking about where. Uh, lower prices for holiday season on general merchandise is where deflation is uh, potentially expected. Okay, softer guidance. Softer guidance, comparable sales growth slows, comp sales growth basically at inflation. Uh, so, PP. Wow. Uh, okay, that is really interesting. Good, good shout out there, um, Poverty Chat. Who was that? Who was that? 
<laughs> Billy Mays here. Oh no. Uh. Anyway, wherever you are, thank you. <laughs> that was a good one. There it is. Malt Maltine. Maltine. That's a cool name. If that's really your name, it's actually kind of cool. Look, look at that. Good job, man. Thanks. Oh. All right. So. Yeah, uh, I knew it. I knew it was a European. I knew it when I saw Maltine. I'm like, where? That's not an American name. That's why ich liebe Grüße aus Berlin. Ist ein Berliner. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's it. We're making you blue. Where are you? How about turning you into a blue? Uh, that was too good. Ein Berliner tells us about Walmart. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, there we go. Make blue. There. Ein Bier für dich. All right. So, um, yeah, this is really interesting. This this Walmart. This is this is what we've been talking about for so long. It's 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 just frustrating because like it's it's almost bittersweet, right? Almost bittersweet because we know we've been talking about this this deflation uh, or at least strong disinflation for eleven months now, but. You know, we've had a really tough last three months in, in a lot of stocks. I mean, look at the volatility of, of uh, Tesla, you know, over the last three months, four months. We're almost at four months, four months of a downtrend on Tesla. You look at, you know, Enphase, it's like, holy crap, uh, right? Uh, you know, I mean, it's just a straight downtrend. It's It's been tough in, in some of these interest rate sensitive positions. And the reason to have had them in the first place was this idea that as rates come down, they will perform very well, knock on wood. But uh, but it's just been so long, like the patience that has been required to actually start seeing people talk about deflation. Woo! Finally, finally, a Wall Street Journal now airing, quote, the best gift ahead of Black Friday, lower prices at stores. The end of price hikes for consumer goods is waning. For over a year, shoppers have pulled back on buying a range of discretionary items from cargo pants to patio furniture as prices for essential goods such as foods have gone up. Now, some retailers say inflation has cooled in many categories, which could further pressure sales growth. Walmart said comp sales. Okay, we already read through all this. Uh, we got a boost from grocery and health and wellness, but general merchandise fell. Apparel, home, toys, gained shoppers in the most recent period. Walmart down now 7%. Really? Jeez, Lord. Posture of retailers being closely uh, monitored. Companies in recent years have boosted their ability to raise price, uh, boasted of their ability to raise prices. Now they're not anymore. Uh, let's see. Vans recently lowered prices on some of its classic sneakers by $5. I think we're an economy where value matters. Yeah, bro. That's absolutely. Uh, let's see here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see here. Levi Strauss CEO uh, told analysts in July that price increases had taken that it had taken on some products over the past two years had gone too far. Oh, I love this consolidation. So as course members, we actually read the Levi earnings call and I thought it was really interesting because they were bragging about, oh yeah, Wall Street Journal's talking about it here. Uh, they're talking about like, oh, but we're not cutting the prices on uh, on uh, on our 501s. Uh, you know, we're keeping those prices up, but, but everything else we're cutting, uh, <laughs> like, oh, that's hilarious. Uh, it's basically a branding, right? It's a way of saying, well, well we're not going to cut prices there. Okay. That'll come. JC Penny is rolling back prices to 2019 levels. Wow. Really? On a variety of items, including a oh, certain sweaters and hoodies. Okay. So Vans cutting prices, Levi cutting prices, JCPenney cutting prices, uh, Costco. Costco was one of the first to tell us, and they're not even listed in this Wall Street Journal article. I'm just going off memory here. Costco made it crystal clear. Costco's like, we will cut prices before we sacrifice volumes because we want people in our store. Why? Because Costco wins off the membership. Remember, like off the top of my head, 50% of Costco's earnings uh, or like it's bottom line. Okay. 50% of Costco's bottom line folks is guess what? You should know this. You should know this 50% of Costco's bottom line 
comes from what? Memberships. That's it. Memberships. Memberships, memberships, memberships. Uh, that's that's massive. Might actually even be a little bit more than that. Uh, so uh, let's see here. This here for all. Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, anyway, so um, they want people in the store. And so one of the first companies that's not going to desperately hold on to price increases is Costco. They will be one of the first to actually signal price cuts are coming. And uh, that's what we saw somewhere around six months ago. Uh, so anyway. Uh, okay, good. So uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Then we have... See, Walmart it's still down about five. I mean, look at the trend, though, that it's had here. It's actually done very well. Uh, it's actually surprising with, with the, the amount of faux PP here. So let's go out to the week chart. This stock performance has been fantastic. So let's see here. So 2022, here you get a drop at the beginning of the year. You're almost, you're, I mean, you've already recovered beyond that. You're beyond that. I think also another thing you're going to find with a company like Walmart is uh, you're going to find that people still see Walmart as a safety tool. And when there's a return to growth, which we're, we haven't fully gotten there yet, uh, that's, I think, when you might, no guarantee, see some more pain for a company like this. Because do consider that you have a company that just now is starting to warn about price cuts. When we return to growth at, uh, as a requirement, these companies, uh, and we're in a more stable economy, I think these companies are setting up for a little bit more pain ahead. Uh, we'll see. Okay, uh, so let's take a quick listen to see what they have here. I think they're at the last three minutes here. Uh, numbers were pretty cool, uh, Mira. Is this the start of something more or, or kind of the end of the beginning? It should hopefully be the start of some more stability into the year and whether it's for stocks or bonds. What we're seeing right now is that moderate news is good news. When we had too good of news throughout the fall, that was actually pushing yields up and pushing stocks down. If we, on the other hand, start to see a dramatic slowdown, things like a negative jobs report, not what we see in the immediate future, that would hurt stocks and bonds as well. So right now in the Goldilocks scenario, where we're kind of right down the middle and more moderate news, that's really supported the market and could support the market into year end. Really, the, the narrative right now at this point in time is we've tamed inflation and we haven't uh, hurt the jobs uh, market. Hey, yo, Curry, who are Corey Bohr, who says I'm a clown. Hit me up, man. What what you got, man? What can we bring you? What kind of value can we bring you? Uh, it, 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 why'd you leave? Give us some transparency. I think it's interesting. True, is it? The linchpin here, as you noted, is really the jobs market, because even as excess savings dwindles, as people have lower savings rates, less deposits, um, all of these stats that we're hearing about headwinds to the consumer, I think that the challenge with an actual slowing consumer is the fact that people have jobs. And when people have money coming in, that's going to continue to support consumption, maybe not as strong as we've seen in the past couple of months, but certainly to a, a reasonable level such that we, we aren't going to see a slowdown in the economy without a slowdown in the consumer. We may not see a slowdown in the consumer without a more weak jobs market. Yep. That's what we just talked about. Got to get the jobs I mean, down. The possibility that, that inflation is resurgent, is, is that, what, what, do you, what would you say the chances are of that? And, and the reason is, if it, if it really is because we spent too much money or because the Fed stayed easy for too long, uh, then that could come back. If it really was supply chain disruptions and, and pandemic-related issues, Maybe we need to go back and revisit whether it was transitory or not. I mean, do you think we're, we think we're finished? You think it's conquered? This is not going to be the, the 70s or 80s. A few weeks ago, we were having a more legitimate conversation about could we see inflation reaccelerate more broadly as investors. But I think the reality is, as we look at the reports, we've seen a great degree of stabilization in some of the supply shocks, whether it's commodity prices or supply chain. Uh, the demand yeah. for goods has come down pretty significantly. It's really about the services. And again, even on the services side, we're starting to see some of that cooling. Um, shelter as well. Rents in the real economy are decelerating. So although we... Okay. 
feel like we're a little stuck here. I think we're going to make some more progress into right. next year, right. especially as we start to see the economy just get back to normal and then All start right, to slow it there. We're, we're out of time. Got to end it there, Mira. Someone just told me tomorrow's Friday, too. Make sure you. I was wondering when they were going to cut her off because it's 6 a.m. They got to go to the next show. I I always think that's a little lame, though, about like the mainstream media. Like, like let, let the finish per, person finish their thought. I don't know. I, 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 she, I mean, we've heard this argument before, though. Uh, but anyway, so um, of course, live will obviously be 6 45 a.m. I'm going to send the alert for that right now. Uh, so that's available. And then uh, that way we could stay on time with our schedule. So we got another 45 minutes here. The uh, But they're not wrong. I mean, it's it's jobs. Jobs is going to be the big game changer here uh, for uh, for what becomes most important, I think, over this next year uh, for what we watch. So uh, let's see here. Uh, CRISPR. Oh, did CRISPR really get some? Uh, they have been an exciting one uh, to watch. Uh, not the stock. I don't know what it's going to do today. I'm sure it'll be up today. But um, let's see here. CRISPR and Vertex get world's first regulatory green light for CRISPR-based medicine. So just to give like a, a a very like high level overview of this as like somebody not in the bio world at all. Imagine your DNA is like a, a, a strand that's this long, let's just say. And uh, then you've got like your A and your G and all these little different codes in it, right? Uh, my understanding is that gene editing would be a way of saying, okay, let's let's go into your DNA, into the DNA of like one of your cells, a stem cell, whatever, and let's let's cut out uh, a bad piece of code, uh, like a bug, and put in the correct code because uh, the little code levels are really just different chemicals. Uh, and then, uh, so you put the little code levels together uh, that create these little, you know, bonds or whatever, and 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 then form uh, the the basis for for DNA. Uh, now, potentially, maybe, maybe you can uh, implant that cell back into somebody, which then hopefully that cell can correct as that cell replicates. It could slowly start replicating better DNA in the rest of your body, and your body copies that. So very experimental. It, who nobody knows is it going to kill you is it going to cure you nobody knows nobody knows but apparently the uk has approved the world's first sickle cell gene editing therapy in partnership with vertex and crispr vertex and crispr have the partnership not the uk government but the uk government has granted that uh, that approval that's great though i mean that is that's on it's great for humanity like i don't even care if you're in the stock or not that's so fantastic uh, for humanity Humanity. All right, let's listen here for a moment. A couple of years last year as well, but you did have high hopes coming into the quarter. Well, they seem still... to be dashed a bit by this guidance. I think that it is Walmart's time. If the cons this is the wheelhouse, if if the consumer is weak, they will go to Walmart. And uh, I don't want to be too granular here, but the, the, in an aisle by aisle contest, you're going to go with with Walmart. I do think the target got to the point where it seemed like that it was doing really poorly. And the and let's remember, same-source sales are the real health uh, lifeblood. Without a doubt. And yet that stock soared yesterday on the gross margin, on the profitability, which was far higher, well, despite, to your point, and we've talked about this, the fact that many expect, or at least there's an expectation, you could still see negative comps next year for Target. Well, I asked, Not going to be the I case asked, for Walmart. I asked oh, 100%. 100 100 That's the concern I have. So I love that they're talking about negative comps. 110% are you going to have negative comps at a company like Walmart? Like, I would put money on it. No guarantees, though. But I, I, I again, I can't guarantee that. It's my opinion. I really think that. So uh, what does that do? Well, imagine this. I want you to think about this and mark this, this date. Put it on a calendar for a year from now and then hold me accountable. A year from now, I want you to look and go, A, does Walmart have negative comps? B, is Walmart stock declining relative to growth stocks? I expect the answer will be yes. I think growth stocks will do that. Walmart stock will do that. Or or like at least flat. Uh, so anyway, uh, let's see here. All right, all right, all right, all right. A fantastic reorganization of the channel. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Mm, v for Vendetta. <laughs> well, that was kind of the idea of like shaving the head. It's like the restart, right? 
Le... <laughs> no, I, I guess first name. You're you're right. Uh, you know, but like I always thought, is it really that big of a deal if they just let somebody talk for another minute or two, and then the next show just starts like a minute or two behind? At, like when it's a finance show, when they're literally just going from anchor to anchor here. I don't know. Maybe 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 it is important for advertising. Uh, did you see Nick T saying Fed's job is done? He did an interview with CNBC this morning. Ooh, I'd love to see that. Uh, I'll, I'll grab that really quick. Let's listen in over here. Pick up particularly apparel, maybe because it got colder. Uh, is there any takeaway, Jim, do you think, either from Target or Walmart or anything else you've heard in terms of the consumer right now? Well, the Target call, there were over 30 instances of, the, of, of Brian Cornell talking about that the consumer was strapped, uh, or, yeah. or in a tough situation, but resilient. And the commentary at it, Walmart is, it, look, we, we're okay. It's kind of where you shop if you feel that you know, the prices are very good at Walmart, as you know. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, I was I was chafing when, when Brian Cornell was saying all these negatives about the consumer, and, and yet the, the profit growth. It, it's good, but the sale, you know, I just, look, the profit growth was so much better than people thought. On and that was a, Yes, and that was a function of they didn't have a bad inventory problem, so there's no discounting, no promotion. And I think that they finally have a, they they have those costs under control. They have freight under control. Stephanie Lincoln was talking about this too earlier this morning. They had a lot of different things that were out of their control supply chain, and they all now are in control. And they're opening stores again. Yep. They just opened a store on 14th Street, which is comping very he, well. 14th he, Street, Manhattan. He told you we like opening stores. Yes, which was good because I had asked them about the clothing. Remember, they did close the close stores. Okay, I want to say something. This is, I think, very important. You know how Kramer here is talking about, hey, like, how come on their uh, earnings call, you know, they still have like optimism, even though the consumer is strapped with guns in San Francisco. Oh, sorry, different strap. Uh, even though the consumer is, is you know, suffering, why, uh, why potentially is there uh, this optimism about growing stores and, and actually being able to, you know, get ahead? Uh, I personally think that even though the consumer is strapped, we're, we're kind of back to this real world of like, and I hate to say it because it's sad, but this paycheck to paycheck world where it's like, yeah, the consumer's strapped. We're not spending like we used to, uh, which was like drunk sailor kind of spending, you know, back in 2021. But it's it's sort of this return to normal. And it's not devastating recessionary style return to normal. Uh, a recessionary style return to normal is kind of like, uh, uh, you know, well, a recessionary change rather would be very much poopy doopy where all of a sudden what you have is uh you know massive negative comps at at every company growth companies stop growing everything just just absolutely goes to trash that's the risk the 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 uh, downside but you're not seeing companies say that yet uh, and that's specifically referring to companies like a firm as well because remember a firm is another one where a firm saying, hey, like, we're not seeing the the recession in in our data. If anything, you know, we're, we're growing, they're growing, their rev they're growing people using a firm like 30%. They're only advertising 12% more. Uh, now, I understand some people are going to say, well, wait a minute. Of course, people are using a firm more. They're taking on more debt uh, because uh, because they're they're stressed. They're exhausted. They, they can't make payments anymore. Yes, on one hand, that's true. But on the other hand, defaults aren't like skyrocketing. I mean, maybe not yet, right? Uh, but uh, I, I don't know. I find it very interesting. Let's listen here to uh, what Max shouted out, which was actually Nick T going on CNBC this morning. Good for him. Let's listen on in for a moment. Nick, is this mission accomplished for the Fed? You know, it, it could be. It sure looks like it might be, but they're not going to say it. I think, Becky, yeah. they're going to be the last ones to say it. So is the Fed done uh, yes, it looks likely, wow. uh, but they are going to be the last ones to say it. I think the question here is, wh where is the case to raise rates right now from here? I mean, you would need to see uh, something in the data that, frankly, we're just not seeing. You would need to see some kind of adverse supply shock. So they have to be relieved, if not uh, quite pleased, with where the data is coming in here. I mean, if you go back six months, let's go back to May and look at where we were in May. Uh, we were getting core inflation readings using the PCE the first five months of the year annualized at 4.4%. Uh, 
the five months since then, uh, if you kind of take the CPI and look at what it's going to do in October for the PCE, you're looking at 2.4% on a five-month annualized basis. So we had a banking crisis. They hiked through a banking crisis. Right now, this looks like a Fed that does not want to hike again. They will if they're dragged into it. But the data is not going to drag them into it if it continues like this. Wow. That's really incredible. That's really, really incredible. Uh, that's, I mean, Nick T is seen as the Fed's mouthpiece for, uh, uh, you, you know, well, basically, you know, he works for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he's nailed a lot of the releases of the Fed uh, and, and also emergency sort of releases as well, where, you know, if the Fed needs to say something, they end up giving, uh, uh, you know, Nick T here a little texty doodle. And then he'll write a Wall Street Journal piece on it. And then everybody copies that piece, right? Uh, this is incredible, though, because this right here is Nick T saying, yeah, they're done, but they're not going to say it. And so it's coming from a very powerful source, uh, given prior leaks. <laughs> uh, and he's not wrong. Why? Why would you, if you're the Fed right now, why would you say you're done. All that would happen, the only thing that would happen is Reddit would go nuts with meme stocks, <laughs> right? Everything would go nuts. Uh, I think play it, play it out. If the Fed right now said we're done and uh, we're going to start cutting rates soon. Let that sink in for a moment. If the Fed said that, what would happen? call option euphoria, you'd have, uh, what was it, Tuesday CPI day where the stock market was up like two points and many stocks were up six to 10%. You'd have that like every day for a week. It would be the coolest thing ever for your stock portfolio. It would be awesome. We'd all be like, hell yeah, tightening cycle over, moon baby. But the problem is then then does that lead to more spending at Walmart, right? Are people then are like, well, you know, stocks went up, I get... I can go buy that TV now at Walmart. Uh, and, and then everybody goes nuts over the real estate market again and the euphoria and then, you know, real estate doesn't have any kind of price correction, uh, which we're already starting to see in, in various different markets, that sort of real estate euphoria again, where all of a sudden, as soon as CPI came in on Tuesday, people are very, they're paying attention to this very closely. The amount of competing offers on properties has gone up like overnight. It's crazy. It's just like all of a sudden it's like CPI comes in, boom, there are more offers now on other properties. So it's like, it's almost like people were kind of waiting for the license to spend on like F Fed's done, right? F done, done, done. Let's, let's, let's see. Yep. Fed's done. Goodbye. <laughs> uh, like it's almost like people are holding back their guard dogs, kind of like ready to attack, or their attack dogs in this case, right? Ready to go, ready to go. Wait, wait, wait for the signal. Okay, go. <laughs> uh, yeah, really, really, uh, really quite interesting. Uh, nice haircut, dude. Yeah, thank you. You know, I did it myself. You think I can get uh, one of those licenses? What, what's that license called to do hair? Yeah, I think I did a good job. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so that is the one cool thing about if you ever, you know, need to, like, if you ever don't like your hair or you want to change things up or whatever, you just shave it off. <laughs> it comes back. Uh, well, not for everybody. So knock on wood. <laughs> uh, okay. So what is this here? Rent hikes of 2021, 2022 to boost, uh, to boost CPI into 2026. What? Inflation is edging back towards edging <laughs> uh, pre-pandemic rates in the U.S., but rent inflation still has a long way to go. To put it into numbers, the all items consumer price index was just 3.2% higher in October than a year earlier, but rent of primary residences was up 7.2%. Meanwhile, the index of markets rate market rates were only up 3.2%. So market rates roughly in line with uh, uh, with what you have for CPI. But what you actually have is uh, rents that are way lower in reality. So this is what that curve looks like uh, right here. Take a look on screen here. This blue line is what shows you uh, this uh, cosmetology. That's it. So it's cosmetology licenses. Transforming into Andrew Tate. You know, maybe if I actually go to the gym, 
uh, I could uh, I could I could pull that off. Uh, but I'll have to start actually going to the gym first. So so maybe we'll start there. <laughs> but uh, I just I like running. That's all I like. I go running. Uh, maybe, but I, I do need to go to the gym. Uh, anyway, so look at that. That's telling you that rent is up 7.2% on CPI when market rents are actually showing 3.2%. So that difference is one of the things keeping inflation elevated. You know, once that, and this is why it's been so painful waiting for that rental deflation to finally hit uh, or disinflation. It's taken so dang long. And you can see, I mean, the magnitude of those uh, of those uh, uh, reports here uh, of the lines. Uh, it's clearly taking a lot longer to get the uh, uh, the government's version of CPI down, which is the white line. Uh, what color is your Bugatti? <laughs> I I, uh, I can't do cars, man. I can't do cars because I got no driveway. It's actually brilliant. You know, if if uh, if you don't want to spend money on cars, don't have a place to put them. <laughs> Watching you from an Italian airport. What's up, man? What are you in Rome? I got married in Rome. Uh, how common is it to borrow to invest? Personally, never tried it. I make money with my own money. You know, most people who are uh, in the real estate world, they don't touch margin ever is what I find. I find that the people who touch margin are stock people. And uh, I don't recommend it. Now, uh, what I do recommend is a borrowing in real estate with 30-year fixed rate debt. That I highly Highly encourage for for you know properties that can support the payments and for people who can support the payment. Remember, this is not broad financial advice; it's just opinion. In general, I, I would lean towards recommending that uh, because there there's money to be made with debt. Maybe not right now in this environment, uh, but with leverage in real estate, uh, which is really exciting. Uh, because if you think about it, house hack uh, doesn't have a dime of debt; uh, it's all cash. Uh, a cash and, and you know the properties we've bought so so it's like another s source of of uh strength when uh when rates fall i mean we're not gonna borrow now kooky dooky right now <laughs> where are your teslas well my dad has one i have one and i sold one to one of my employees but yeah i i uh, don't get me wrong i love nice cars and i get like excited by the mclarens i walk by or whatever i'm super excited about that uh, but i'm not uh, uh i just don't have room so I got a plane instead. <laughs> uh, the, the, the plane is so important for, for what we're doing with these different companies. It, it just wouldn't be possible otherwise. Nike Swoosh Recovery, still agree with that. Uh, let's see here. My credit cards are maxed out, so deflation is great for me. Please let this be the beginning of deflation. Yeah, uh, that could happen. Uh, I, I, I believe that. It's... Um, it's unfortunate uh, to be in that situation. Uh, so, uh, okay, Walmart's down 5.8% now, still in pre-market. You got Tesla still a little down here in pre-market, uh, probably as uh, yields are a little higher than where they were a couple days ago. Uh, keep in mind, it was up 2.29% just yesterday, so a little bit of a give back. Wouldn't be surprised, honestly, to see this market turn green today. Uh, yesterday, you know, somewhat made sense. We had some softening after the data, uh, mostly because you had such a run on Tuesday. But today, I, I just wouldn't be surprised to see this market turn uh, turn green into the end of the day, unless we got some bad news. But I mean, what do we have on the on the on the setup here? We've got I mean, most of the data we just got: industrial production month over month down 0.6 percent. Philadelphia Fed outlook a little better than expected. Uh, jobless claims a little higher than expected. Import prices you know, in totally in deflation. I mean, full deflation for import and export prices, full deflation. Uh, oh, you might not believe that. So let me, let me just show it to you. Uh, <laughs> I, I always think it's neat to see the numbers on screen. I, I'm very proud of myself, by the way, I have it now to where if I take a screenshot on the PC within about five seconds, it shows up on my Mac. I know that sounds like stupid and basic, but it's a big deal to me. Okay. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, so here you go. Look at that. That's deflation. That's full deflation right there. Cosplaying Jim Cramer. Oh, that's a good idea. Should I should, I should get a sports coat and pull the Jim Cramer. <laughs> that's funny. Uh, Cinestyle. It's, it's like a reset. 
playing Rune, RuneScape right now. That's real work. <laughs> uh, I miss RuneScape. Any update on House Hive? It's doing great. What do you want to know? Uh, are you going to sign right on your plane? Hey, Tate, I own my own plane. You know, I, 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 I really try to stay away from relativity as much as possible because mostly you could always find somebody who's got a bigger plane or, you know, a different lifestyle or this, that, or whatever. Yeah, I, I'm pretty grateful for, for what we've got. I mean, I got these two beautiful little twins that are like two and a half weeks old upstairs. Uh, you know, we've got Jack's, Jack and Max, uh, eight and five, and Lauren's awesome. So, you know, knock on wood, we've surrounded an, an, an amazing team uh, for all the companies too. So we've got some really great people, and I think that's so much more valuable uh, than uh, than Dalahalas. Uh, I, I know that's it's obviously uh, challenging when uh, when the Dalahalas are tight, but uh, yeah, I, I, that that Dalahalas don't cure sadness. Uh, okay, so they help a little bit. Starbucks Union less powerful than lattes. Okay, that's an interesting headline. Banks margin deposits uh, cause uh, to improve rates. I go, okay, what is this? Uh, okay. Okay, so, oh, it's worth noting this article, just to finish that thought on this article, this article that discusses rate, uh, interest, or um, rents lagging so much uh, suggests that this could be a deflationary force all the way through 2026 and 7, which is quite interesting because it really suggests we could have this deflationary push for quite a while where you'll actually get below trend CPI for the next three to three and a half years. About a third of CPI is core uh, is, is housing. About a third of core CPI is housing. The disparity between the numbers is because of the lag and the way it's measured. Good news is that CPI rents and market rents will converge eventually. The bad news is it may take a while. Yeah. Okay. Here's a chart of the con uh, uh, the divergence, which which is very interesting because they've almost always been aligned. You could see that here. They've almost always been in alignment with this like perfect alignment to the left here, uh, and this divergence here is what CPI is catching up to because you could see that rent prices exploded past CPI. Now CPI is pushing up and then coming down. Uh, yeah. Okay. One sec. Okay. Good. That's good. Uh, so, so in other words, this is going to be something that's a disinflationary force. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, one sec. This is going to be something that's a deflationary force between now and, uh, and quite frankly, uh, the next three years. This rollover, uh, which is good because it, it, in one way, it'll actually make it seem like we're not in deflation, where, where consumer good prices are going down because the housing will, will prop up the entire line. But, uh, but it certainly will support the trend of, of lowering inflation. Looks like uh, Macy's reported. Let's take a peek at this. Uh, let's see here. Macy's, 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 Macy's. Jim Cramer says Walmart not too bad. Well, I guess we know which way that stock's going to go. Okay, so. Uh, okay, uh, EPS at Macy's. Adjusted EPS comes in at 21 cents versus the 7 cents expected. Margin 40.3. Uh, let's see here. Forecast guide. A little tighter, but roughly the same. Holiday period, healthy inventory. Mm, expects less than 10 store locations in early 2024 to close. Macy's pops 10% as inventory margin help improve. So you got some optimism going into Q4 here, whereas the CEO at Walmart kind of had a little bit of pessimism going on. Uh... Yeah. One sec. Okay. So, yeah. 
Okay, that's Macy's. Look, I'm going to see the actual stock performances. Uh, and then we'll take out, okay, CNBC is on break. We will go there in a moment. So let's look at Macy's. Macy's, let's see how their performance has been. Macy's? Yeah, interesting. Macy's has been getting whacked compared to Walmart. I mean, it's almost the opposite trend here. This is the week chart right now. Shows you Macy's topping off two years ago. And from two years ago, wow, Macy's, I mean, Macy's stock performance. If you had bought Macy's at the top, you'd be down 36% over one year and you'd be down 68% in five years. Yikes. Uh, I don't even, like even Tesla's not that bad off. Well, if you bought it off the top, you'd be down about 40%. That's if you bought Tesla at like 400. That one time it was at 400 for like a day. Wow. That's interesting. So Macy's down, Walmart, actually been trending very very nicely here very good trend again i don't i don't think that'll last but we'll see uh and then how's uh Target on its trend yeah Target more of a macy's uh move here what about costco 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 very walmart-esque i wonder if it's like costco sam's club very interesting okay let's go to alibaba Ooh, Alibaba, 87 bucks down 8% in the pre-market. Well, what happened to Baba then in the pre-market? Let me look at this. Okay, how much weight do you think the election has on the market? Ooh, that's a really good question. You know, obviously it's, it's way too soon to tell, but I think in a year from now, the economy will actually be looking a lot more optimistic and hopeful. That's bad for Trump. Trump needs the economy to be bad going into next his, the election. Because if you had the election right now, Trump would win. You go into the election and the stock market's skyrocketing, interest rates are plummeting, people are feeling good again. Biden could win solely based on the economy. Yeah. Uh, this is not political, purely just... <laughs> what what is actually uh you know uh, likely in terms of uh the stock market okay so baba we're about three minutes from the bell here so alibaba alibaba wants to focus on growth not financial engineering you should never focus on financial engineering okay that's a weird statement Digital commerce prepares for external fundraising. IPO plan has been put on hold. U.S. chip ban materially affecting cloud operations. Yeah, well, that makes sense. All right. Not to proceed with spinoff of cloud biz. Adjusted earnings. Pretty close, actually. Just slightly less than, it's like one penny less than expected in dollars. Cash dividend. For the uh, ADS, that's fine. That's the American Depositories. Second quarter revenue, tiny, tiny B. I don't actually see any. Extends losses after results. Yeah, that's fine. But what was so bad about them? I think maybe just put the material weakness in the cloud segment and then not spinning off the cloud segment. Because usually if you spin off, you're going to make a profit on that spin off. Yeah, because you're going to sell it for a premium and then that'll help you raise capital. So you won't get that and you're stuck holding the bag with the chip ban. That's probably why, why you've got a Baba sell off right here. Yeah. Mm, yeah. There are a few thousand of us that live for this kind of stream. Thank you, dude. Uh, I know it's a special person to be interested in stocks and company earnings before the sun's up uh, when it's not a bull run. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> well, I like doing this stuff. Yeah, it's it's the spin off. Uh, I think it's not spinning. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. Jack Ma selling stock. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see deflation, but economy will be strong. Yeah, so the economy can actually do well as real wages go positive, and they are positive. They will be vastly more positive as uh, as more deflation sets in. I'll explain that more after the bell here. But it's a very good question. But yes, yes. Talks about Intel share actually maybe flatting. They've been losing share, losing share. Uh, and I 
think that when you do El Tiro spin-off, uh, that is worth a lot of money. Uh, look, uh, he's got the company humming. They are going to be coming to New York in December. I think Let's get the opening bell here on the CBC World Time Exchange. The big boys of this Hamilton Insurance Group celebrating its recent IPO. And at the NASDAQ, National Women's Soccer League Champions, Aquam FC. Got some F1 action tonight as well. Oh, I can't wait. Now, I've got to tell you, I always like... All right, so about what, like 50-50 uh, there? Uh, I, I will say I see somebody here asking about Commodity Steve. Uh, we miss Commodity Steve. It's worth this is a broad base here of commodity prices, the Bloomberg Commodities Index. And so we could see that it's sort of this peak in commodities here about mid 22 and a rotation down since then, still a little bit elevated from where we were previously. However, Commodity Steve has been 100% on on uranium. He told me to buy some uranium stock, and uranium's doing great, uranium spot prices. So, very, very interesting. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's there's uranium for you on a wider scale. I I don't I don't do much with with the rocks, but uh, yeah. So as far as uh, and I want to see how things are moving in the open here. But as far as can the economy do well in deflation? Yes, actually the economy can do extremely well in deflation. In fact, deflation is quite frankly why we printed so much money. Had we not printed money over the past forty years, we would have been in deflation, substantial deflation, and that's very dangerous because. Deflation actually leads the consumer to say, <clears throat> why would I buy now if prices are just going to be lower soon? So then they wait. And then that actually, via the velocity of money, destroys the economy more. So it's actually a horrible thing. Deflation is, is worse than inflation. Uh, so, so they will print money as much as they need to to prevent deflation. That money printing will then translate into looser credit conditions, easier to borrow, lower interest rate, lower cost to borrow, lower cost of products and higher stock in real estate market. That's why you want access to assets, real assets. You don't want to be in, in cash very long generally because the Fed will always force inflation to the extent that they're capable of doing so. Uh, so anyway, yeah, uh, let's see here. Mm, let's see here, Tesla, 1.6%. David, it's a joke. Get that stick out of your butt. Uh, NVIDIA is trying to move a lot of things sideways right now. Outlet got its de novo FDA approval uh, for its outlet sock. So it's been popping off the bottom here after just years of sitting down in the toilet. Baba dropping a little bit more here, now down 10%. Costco dropping 3.7% in sympathy with Walmart. Walmart now down 7.2%. Here comes that rollover. I think this is your where you start getting that rollover on the uh, staple stocks. Enphase trying to find a direction, slightly green here. Q's trending down. Yep, another candle there as I clicked away. Tesla trying to trend up here. Uh, NVIDIA can't figure it out either. The small caps are the ones getting reamed, which makes sense because they're the ones most exposed to these higher interest rates. They're the ones most exposed to the consumer. Folks, look at Intel, baby. This is one of my faves too. Uh, we've been buying this sucker since like 29 or 30 bucks or something like that. Everybody still thinks this is a value trap. I, I, I mean, it could be. That's the risk of it. I think it's pure value, uh, especially in their manufacturing capabilities. Uh, that is, that's betting on America right there. Macy's pushing up a nice ten percent. Intel's up there beating Apple today. On the downside, we've got Alibaba, Walmart, SoFi. SoFi's been so volatile. Uh, Costco. Although we did have a nice little run there in some of the smaller caps over the last few days, as inflation has come in a little softer than expected. So, okay, let me see what uh, what else markets are saying here. Do you think, what do you think about 10-year going lower? Well, it needs to, you know, that's the loosening of financial conditions that uh, is actually going to be what the Fed is trying to engineer. The, the Fed doesn't need, for inflation to keep coming in down low, inflation, does, the Fed does not need interest rates this high. I'd say you could probably go to a 10-year at like 3.8 and the Fed would actually still be okay with not raising rates, likely. So I wouldn't be surprised you know, as these yields really start confirming a downtrend, more people are going to be comfortable buying bonds because they'll feel there's less risk in, uh, you know, this this sort of a capital uh, eradication of buying bonds too soon and then yields jumping and then your the value of your bond portfolio plummeting. So that's, you know, that that's painful for people. 
So I personally would stay away from, I mean, this is just my opinion. I personally am not too interested in like getting into Costco under 500 bucks or whatever. I think come back to the staples in a year. Like when we actually start getting low rates and people throw their money into growth stocks as opposed to the staples, that's when the staples are going to be more attractive. But it's way, way too soon, in my opinion. Uh, let's see here. Intel, 52-week high, baby. Let's go. Ulta looking like a buy. You know, Ulta had such amazing growth during the pandemic, really during the reopening. And uh, and, and it's it, uh, it wouldn't surprise me if they've been rolling over. I have not been paying attention to them very much. Uh, oh, look at that. Very interesting. So they broke their trend. Oh, wow. Yeah, look at that. So, so you broke the downtrend. You're bouncing off the 200-day moving average here. Wow. Yeah, you're right. I mean, from a TA point of view, just looking at the uh, where it is between the moving averages here, not bad. Uh, you got some nice support there under you. But uh, even Macy's is starting now to get hit a little bit following uh, following that Walmart miss there. Uh, Target's still trying to push up, but negative here. So we'll see uh, markets a little... Uh, markets directionless at the moment. Yeah, might be another sideways day. We'll see. We'll see. Let's take a listen to CNBC for a moment. More out of control that we should put troops there, but I know that's not our posture. Uh, broad retail weakness, Jim. Dollar General, Costco, Walmart, of course, is the story, but Dollar Tree, Etsy's also in there. Yeah, I, it's funny. Ooh. It's just, it's so indiscriminate. It, Costco's actually, this is like my problem with Walmart. If you really think that Brian Cornell's right about the consumer and there's all these different reservations, then you, you should be buying Costco. But again, Costco is at a high. These stocks were at highs, and there's going to be rotation into other places that are not doing as well. I find that this is a market that has said, all right, we see what's hot, Magnificent 7, let's take some profits, Magnificent 7. Uh, retail's been hot, let's take some profits, and let's find areas that aren't the, that aren't doing as well. I mean, I have, the, I have CSX on tonight. That stock said nothing, so let's go buy some CSX. And the market sometimes is that stupid. All right, they're listening. See that? Yeah. Well, I'm just you know, buy some CSX. Right. Uh, D- David, are the brokerage stocks ever going to come back? I don't know, Jim. I don't know. Uh, I mean, they did earlier in the week. Like Robinhood? The CPI number in particular, not brokerage, but banking. I mean, Bank America up mm-hmm. sharply given the benefit to its bond right. portfolio that we've talked so often about as being a real victim of the move higher in rates, particularly right. at the long end. Uh, yeah, but, you know, Gorman's making some today. comments. Yeah, um, James Gorman made some comments. I think CNBC Asia. Yeah, uh, they were positive, constructive. They? Yeah, constructive. Now I, I, I hate to do see. James- okay, so uh, what I, uh, what I do think is interesting also is the way markets have allocated to this bull run, and we've seen this before. But the way P- uh, markets have allocated to this bull run has really been the big seven, right? Your Apple. Amazon, Google, Facebook, Tesla. This is this is the the blue line is the magnificent seven as they're called, and then the white line is the S and P five hundred equal weighted. So it's basically like you're still seeing all the gains of this market, driven by the big seven, and uh, and a lot of folks see the rest of the market potentially uh, too pessimistically priced. So, but in my opinion, and this this is just my opinion, when this rallies, so let's draw this out, uh, draw the thesis out, okay? Uh, No, let's go with an arrow here. All right. So a lot of folks believe that when the white line goes up, that will be financed from the Magnificent Seven. I actually don't believe that. I think if the white line goes up, you're getting that financed from bonds and cash and money markets. And you'll also see this continue up. And that's why, you know, I've been calling for this sort of Nike swoosh recovery, volatile Nike swoosh recovery. I've always said that. Uh, I've said that since the beginning. <laughs> Don't take the volatile away from me. And I, how many times did I correct people when they're like, Kevin, the Nike swoosh recovery, it's happening. And then I'm like, be careful. It's like, I'm calling it volatile Nike swoosh. We haven't seen the volatility yet, but it'll come. And then sure enough, the last three months have been hell, right? So like, like we did say it was going to be volatile. <laughs> but anyway, I don't actually think you're going to see a collapse of the Magnificent Seven. I think one of the reasons you're seeing this spread, and people get mad at me for this, so I want to be clear about this. I think one of the reasons you're seeing this spread is because 
These are the best companies. These are the best quality companies that exist. There are a lot of people who say, but Kevin, you know, this isn't fair to the small caps or, or uh, you know, uh, tech is overvalued. Uh, tech has, has too, much, uh, too much hopium in it because of AI or whatever. Let me be crystal clear here. The future of our economy is tech-based. And so the biggest companies in the world will do the best. The smallest companies will probably do the worst. So you have to remember, when you look at some of the bears, like the Kobisi letter, which, you know, they uh, they get views by being bears. And it's fine. Do what you got to do to get views. I, I just I just can't do that because it would be disingenuous. So, uh, and maybe they truly believe it. I'm not saying they're disingenuous. I'm just saying I can't do the bear narrative because I don't believe in it. But anyway, so here you have, uh, this is incredible. The NASDAQ 100 to Russell 2000 is 10% above its 2020 peak. Okay, so this is saying tech stocks relative. Okay, this is a ratio here. The, the tech, uh, tech stocks relative to small caps are 10% higher than the 2020 peak and 6% above the 2000 peak. Basically, what they're trying to say is like, it's a tech bubble, the dot-com bubble all over again, blotty, blotty, blotty. But the reality is, tech companies today are where the real earnings are, not in the Russell. A lot of the Russell stocks are money losers, and they're risky, and they face bankruptcy, and they face high interest rates. The tech companies... They're making money hand over fist. Look at Microsoft with like 40 plus percent gross margin or a bottom line. You know, gross margins are like 80 percent. Bottom line margins like 40 percent. They make money hand over fist. They make money on the cash they have made. They make money on on uh, uh, the cash they have invested. They make money on their products hand over fist. They are investing. They will single handedly prop NVIDIA to new highs. I, I'll have a deep dive video coming out on Tesla, NVIDIA and Enphase. Uh, three separate videos. Those will be on the main channel. So stay tuned for those. Those will be really good. Uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it is, it's really, uh, it, it makes sense to some extent that the largest companies are going to perform the best because you are finally in an environment where those are not 2000 style stocks where 2000 small style stocks were money losers subject to high interest rates like small caps today. So the underlying has changed. I think that's important to pay attention to. Fading some of those gains on Macy's uh, up about 8% right now. A little bit more of a rotation down there on Tesla. Q still down about a quarter of a percent. Still looking for direction here. NVIDIA thinks the direction is down today. Etsy down about 2.4%. Apple's still green. I think Intel was still doing well here. Let's take a peek at Intel here. Yeah, Intel up about 3%. Look at that Intel growth. Mm. Mm, delicious. Uh, so uh, we'll pay attention to this as well. All right. Uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to go to the course member live stream right after I make a cup of coffee. So, uh, hey, do me a favor if you can. Subscribe to this channel. This is the Meet Kevin Live. But also, if you want to be live with me in about two hours and 15 minutes, we're just going to do politics. Uh, and so that's going to be me being as unbiased as possible, as much as that is possible. Just going through the political news uh, and I think that'll be high quality. It'll be the first time we've ever done that. So make sure you subscribe to that as well. If you just go to this YouTube channel, you can see a link to all of them where I'll put it into the, uh, I'll put, actually, I think the links are in the description for all of us. So you could find those, uh, that, so yeah, yeah, all the links are in the description. So there's the podcast. Oh, I forgot. We have a house hack channel now. Uh, you could find that link. Uh, I'll, I'll add that to the description a little bit later, but we're going to do a separate channel for house hack as well. Uh, so that'll be pretty cool. So stay tuned for that. Uh, and then, of course, just close the fucking door. Close the door. Yeah. Even though I'm a licensed financial advisor, real estate broker, and becoming a stock broker, this video is neither personalized financial advice nor real estate advice for you. It is not tax, legal, or otherwise personalized advice tailored to you. This video provides generalized perspective, information, and commentary. Any third-party content I show should not be deemed endorsed by me. This video is not and shall never be deemed reasonably sufficient information for the purpose of evaluating a security or investment decision. Any links or promoted products are either paid affiliations or products or services which we may benefit from. I personally operate and actively manage ETF and hold long positions in various securities, potentially including those mentioned in this video. However, I have no relationship to any issuers other than Health Act, nor am I presently acting as a market maker. Nice.
uh, yeah, some of those links were broken. You're right about that. So I'm fixing that right now. And so if you give me another second here, I'll skip my coffee and then I will, um, let me just put the, uh, house hack. Where the hell is it? Uh, okay. Well, that's annoying. Anyway, I'll add it to the description. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you soon. Bye.